Good morning and welcome. Why should I trust the Bible? That's today's question that we're going to be tackling in just a minute. Before we do, my name is Pastor A.J. Massick. I'm the Highlands Campus Pastor here at Renewal Church. Great to be with you today. Turn to your neighbor and say, great to see you this morning. One, one great community this morning. Thanks for joining together as the body of Christ. We are a better community with each and every person here as a part of it, sharing their gifts and helping us all to go on that journey of following Jesus together. Why should I trust the Bible? I remember once uh, many years ago sitting across the table from some friends, eating some hot wings at a restaurant, and one new acquaintance across the table said, I, you can't tell me that the Bible has not changed over time. That this was sort of an obvious foregone conclusion, right? How many of you guys have heard this argument about Scripture, that it's probably changed over time, it's been twisted and changed, uh, or even thought this argument too, right? I think we've all gone, I wonder, at various points in our lives. Um, statistics show 88% of Americans have a Bible in their household, uh, 25% of Americans have five Bibles in their household. You know who you are. You're the hoarders, all right? Uh, there's, no, there's no other way to say it, okay? Uh, 13% of Americans actually went out and bought a Bible, a new Bible, last year, even though 88% of us already had one in the house, right? Uh, but why? Why this obsession with the Bible? Is it the inspired and infallible Word of God or should we be putting these explicit warning stickers on the Bible? Careful what you'll see within backwards and antiquated thinking. What's, what's the truth of it, right? In John 18, Jesus is talking with Pilate after he's arrested. And he says that he has come to bear witness to the truth. And those who are of the truth will hear his word and practice them, right? And Pilate, of course, the famous retort, what is truth? That's a fair question, right? And believe it or not, uh, you know, I uh, tend to have a very skeptical spirit at times. I have had to dig into Scripture and go, what do I believe about this? These are questions I've had as well, right? And one book that I read that really changed me is this book, Josh McDowell's The New Evidence that demands a verdict, right? Uh, Josh had sort of a Lee Strobel type story of setting out trying to disprove scripture and, and God's existence and coming away with the total opposite of, man, I have to believe in him based on what I've discovered. It's a book that's not a uh, beer book. There's like 800 pages in this sucker, all right? Uh, and a lot of it's research and notes and stuff like that. You don't just read it, all right? Uh, it's more like a whiskey. You sip it, okay? You, you get little bits of it at a time. But it's an amazing book that changed uh, my perception of this topic. Big shout out to this book. Much of the research that we'll be sharing today will be coming out of that book. Um, but my goal today for us uh, is I want to share a bit of what I've discovered through my own personal journey. I'm not out to convince you. Only you can convince you. On the contrary, I hope to share some stuff you haven't heard before that you might not know uh, in order to make you hungry for more, uh, to make you curious for more. We'll have the text question number going today. It's in the bottom corner of the screen. I encourage you to text in your follow-up questions, and there should be tons of them because it's a huge topic, and we want to continue to dialogue around this and ultimately to realize today that much of the criticism directed at God's Word comes from a place of ignorance, um, and that's not an insult but just a fact that a lot of the stuff that gets tossed out over a table and a plate of buffalo wings is stuff that may, you may have heard, just kind of passed around in culture, but is it based on research? That's what we're going to get into today. And so I hope you'll track with me. There's some awesome stuff going on today. First off, I want to introduce you to the uniqueness of the Bible. It's, it's an incredibly unique book. There's no other book like it, right? Not just because of its content, but the circumstances around it. Right? It was written over 1,600 years. Who takes 1,600 years to write a book? All right? Uh, it might take you 1,600 years to read this one, but no. Um, it's made up of 39 books and letters in the Old Testament, uh, 27 in the New Testament. Uh, it's made up of seven different types of, or excuse me, not seven different types, but uh, multiple different types of literature. 
You know, we've got apocalyptic literature, which is heavily symbolic and metaphoric, right? We've got uh, poetry, we've got history, we've got songs and prophecy, we've got all sorts of literature types uh, in this book. It's incredibly diverse in what it covers, right? Uh, it's arranged primarily topically, but then also chronologically within topics. So, so it may be a bit of a, a light bulb for you to realize it's not arranged just chronologically, but categorically, and then within the categories, kind of chronologically, okay? And so this is why, if, who here has ever started and tried to read the Bible from cover to cover, right? And you probably gave up in book three in Leviticus, right? Uh, only a book that's as secure in itself as the Bible can be as boring as Leviticus uh, and as repetitive. No, I'm just kidding. But it has the appearance at first of seeming boring until you dig in uh, and dig deeper, right? But the purpose of the Bible is also unique. The Bible tells us uh, about God's story of creation, salvation, and then the recreation of the world from the redemption of Jesus, right? The Bible is a book that contains science, but it's not just a science textbook. It contains history, but it's not just a history textbook. It contains poetry, but it's not just a book of poetry, right? It is written so that we may believe, next slide please, in Jesus Christ, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, that Jesus is at the beginning, he's at the center, and he's at the end of this grand story of God's creation, the fall into sin, the redemption of the world, and the recreation of the world, beautiful, just as he intended it to be. And so when we look at scripture, we've got the Old Testament uh, written in Hebrew and in Aramaic, and then we've got the New Testament. I want to talk about both of those and how we got those, right? First off, the Old Testament. The Old Testament was completed about 400 BC, right? Uh, and I want to talk a bit about the process of copying it, because sometimes we may just think, oh, so-and-so looked at the old copy and they wrote it down and that's how they copied it, right? But no, people who copied the scriptures had to study for 10 years before they were allowed to put pen to paper uh, on a real copy of scripture. Uh, back in those days, they were scrolls. They were giant scrolls that would be rolled out, not codex books like we're used to, right? But a scroll had to be prepared by a Jew in full ceremonial dress. Who here has seen that, like, picture going around on social media of, in the 60s, the sewing machine manuals instructing, you know, women to get their best dress and to clean up the house before you sat down at the machine? I'm picturing that sort of thing here, right? Uh, only a guy in, in ceremonial dress here, right? Um, Nothing can be written from memory, even if you have it memorized. You must not write the name of God with a newly dipped pen because you don't want to splotch it with the ink or whatever else, right? Should a king address you while you're writing God's name, you must take no notice of him and finish writing that name. They had a very intense process of, of taking the originals and making copies and copies and copies that were highly, highly accurate, right? And those copying the New Testament would also draw from this tradition as well. Now, when it comes to, to how we got the New Testament, they had to figure out, because there was kind of a lot of stuff going around, right? There were letters being sent from all sorts of people to churches and individuals, and they had to figure out which letters are legit and which ones aren't. Because just like anything uh, in today's world, people would try and co-opt things in the old, in the ancient world as well, right? And so you've got this new Jesus movement going around, and you've got all the legitimate letters being written and inspired by, by God from the apostles and from the disciples going down to other people, but you've also got people who are just trying to get in on it, writing their own thing, trying to make a big name for themselves, trying to be a big deal, uh, and even people maliciously trying to undermine the new movement by sneaking books in that have nothing to do with what's actually going on. And so when it comes to how we have the New Testament, uh, back one please, um, there are three categories in which they'd look at the letters, right? So they would look at letters and go, um, this letter might be homologumina, widely accepted as being legit inspired by God, right? They might look at one as antilegomena, as we're not really sure. It's kind of questionable here, right? And then spurious would be books that were obviously malicious or evil or not scripture in their intent, right? And so to test these books, uh, what they had is a five-fold test, okay? Um, they wanted to see, was it written by a prophet or an apostle? So authorship's really important. In fact, Basically, every book of Scripture, we know who wrote it, with the exception of the New Testament book of Hebrews, which was confirmed through other methods, so we'll get to that. Uh, does it have a scriptural quality, right? Does it obviously have a weight to it? Does it speak the truth? Is it consistent with the other Scriptures, Old Testament and New, or is it contradictory, showing that it's not part of God's story? 
uh, or was it confirmed elsewhere in Scripture? Right? So uh, Jesus confirms much of the Old Testament in his thoughts. He even uh, confirms for us that Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, and so they would use these tests to figure out, is this thing a legit part of Scripture? And the canon of Scripture, as we now know, the 66 books, was formalized at the Council of Carthage by 397 uh, AD. It was a long process of just prayerful consideration over these things and, and a lot of de debate to go, in which letters is God working and moving and which ones is it obvious that he's not, right? But the big question people will all often ask is the one we raised at the beginning. How do I know that the Bible hasn't been changed over time? I want to know that through the process of it being copied and translated, how do we know that the integrity was maintained? And so we want to look at manuscripts, right? Uh, manuscripts are handwritten works that were written before the invention of the printing press in 1436, and handwritten works that were made on papyrus, which is like reeds flattened into paper, on parchment, which is animal skin that's been stretched into something you can write on, or on vellum, which was like nicer parchment made out of calf skin type of deal, right? Uh, and so all of these manuscripts that were written back in the day, the problem is they're written on things that deteriorate. They don't last. Uh, and so we actually don't have any of the original autographs of Scripture, the original ones that were written. We have a, a lot of copies, right? And we want to know th those copies, they're highly deteriorated in a lot of cases. Um, but we want to know, are there a lot of, of these copies to compare? And then we can see where words changed uh, and so forth, right? And, and as an exercise here, I'm going to ask this question. How many of you guys... Um, believe that Homer wrote the Iliad, that Greek epic poem. You probably learned about it in school, right? Did any of you question, I wonder if Homer really wrote this, right? Um, 643 manuscripts are known to exist of the Iliad. You probably should believe that Homer wrote it. There's a lot of manuscripts to, to prove its integrity, right? But what about the New Testament, right? We often hear the New Testament surely must have been changed over time. How do we know uh, that hasn't been changed? The New Testament has about 25,000 manuscripts known to exist. It's in a total class of its own, right? There are about 15, uh, excuse me, 5,700 written in the original Greek, about 19,300 written in other languages that can, can be compared against one another. Um, it the, was the most circulated, most copied, most translated book of antiquity in a total class of its own. Nothing comes close to touching it, right? Uh, John Montgomery says in one of his works that no documents of the, of the ancient period are as well attested as Scripture. Second to none, right? Um, and another thing that's really crucial to establishing how accurate do we believe that it is, is the gap. So with, with every copy, there's a, the gap period between the original writing and the first copy that we have. And we want that gap to be really short, right? Because we can't account for what happened during that gap. We want to make sure it's a short gap to ensure, uh, you know, that lots of funny business didn't happen, right? But when, again, you look at works of antiquity between the autograph and the closest manuscript, what you see is, again, the New Testament's in a total class of its own. We've got fragments from 100 AD, full books from about 200 AD, uh, full Bibles from about 300 AD. Um, but as you can see from most of these other works that none of us ever question the authorship or the accuracy of, some of these have 1,000-year, 1,500-year gaps between the original and the closest copy that we have. The oldest known Bible fragment is from a fragment of John 18, dating from 114 AD. And this is the passage we read earlier, What is Truth? The oldest complete Bible we have is uh, Codex Vaticanus from 325 AD. But when we compare the manuscripts, this is the big question, right? When we compare them, what are the differences we see? When we look at them, are they drastically different where a lot of words changed and so forth, right? And what we find is of the about 150K differences noted, which sounds like an awful lot, does it not? 99% are spelling and penmanship differences. When they would comb through these things, they'd look, and they'd look at if a letter was hooked differently, then that would be noted, right? Uh, they would went through all of these, and they looked, and most differences can be left up to penmanship, uh, to a hook instead of a whatever, right, uh, to spelling, that sort of deal. And here's the real-life test, all right? So we want to know, does it hold up under real-life circumstances? Well, in 1946, 1947, two teenage shepherd boys stumbled upon would probably be the, the best, the most incredible archaeological discovery of the 20th century, which became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
They discovered them in an area known as Qumran, which was occupied by a Jewish group called the Essenes from about 250 BC to 70 AD. And this Jewish group, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were kind of off on their own though. They, they had their own thing going on. It, but they copied scriptures meticulously. Over 100,000 uh, different manuscripts were found in these caves and jars that have been sitting there for like 1,900 years, something like that, right? And we would want to know this is a great opportunity to look at those manuscripts that have sat undisturbed for 1,900 years, compare them against what we have, and go, do they match up? Does what we have seem accurate? So an example here from the book of Isaiah. Our prior oldest complete scroll was from 980 AD, and in the Qumran collection, there's one that dated to 125 BC. And so we've got about an 1,100-year difference. This is a great test to go in this gap period where we couldn't account for it where lots of things changed. What we find is 95% accuracy, with the remaining 5%, again, being mostly penmanship and spelling. It even breaks it down here out of the 166 words. We've got 10 letters that are spelling difference, four stylistic changes. We have one word for light added and no effect on biblical teaching, right? And so if you've ever wondered, is scripture trustworthy? It is absolutely trustworthy. You can trust that the scripture, the Bible that you have in your hands is an accurate translation of the original autographs of scripture. The, the Protestant reformers in the 16th century, they took up the mantra, sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. It means scripture alone, the word of God is the sole rule and norm of all doctrine, of all faith and practice. It's the thing that we base everything on. There's nothing else that exists that we can go to and say it's inspired, that it's infallible, that it's God-given for us, and that we can trust it 100%, right? But manuscripts aside, there's even more reason to believe in Scripture. If you look at the content of Scripture, um, there are many reasons. <coughs> Excuse me. Ancient historians can verify some of the events in the Bible. This is really cool. Uh, Thallus verified the supernatural darkness at the time of Jesus' death at his crucifixion. Darkness comes over the land. He calls an eclipse, right? Because he didn't know what, what else to call it, but no eclipse was scheduled during that time, right? Uh, just Josephus verifies that Jesus existed, did miracles, was crucified, so forth. A whole host of other historians like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Origen, Tertullian, Eusebius, all these people have quoted the New Testament extensively and verify some of the events in it, right? Modern historians as well can verify some of the events in Scripture. This is really cool. Uh, in 2007, the British Museum discovered a receipt from nearly 600 B.C. I had no idea they had receipts, in 600 BC. Anyone else? Um, and it's like literally a rock. You know, I don't know, if you were doing your taxes, be like, hold on, let me get my box of rocks. I'll be right back, right? You're not just going to carry those things around, I guess. But it's a receipt from 600 BC, and it confirms the existence of Nebuchadnezzar, the chief eunuch of Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon. He was otherwise only known to history in Jeremiah 39, and then scripture unearths an actual artifact verifying his existence, verifying that scripture was right all along. Uh, and if the Bible is right about small details, guys, this guy does not matter uh, to the overall thing, right? He, he does not matter. But if scripture is right about the overall details like this, the small details, you can surmise that it can be trustworthy with some of the bigger ones as well, right? Scripture verifies some scientific knowledge before it was widely available, right? That the earth floats in space, uh, you know, that the earth is round, that there's one human race. Shockingly, for a long time, people believe there are multiple human races, right? Um, that there are springs in the ocean floor, things like medical quarantine. Priests in the Old Testament served a, a medical function in helping quarantine sick people and keeping others free from being sick. Guys, we didn't even figure out you're supposed to wash your hands until like two centuries ago. Uh, and scripture knew a bunch of this stuff. This one's really fascinating. Um, scripture, up until 1872, the Bible was the only place that you could learn about the Hittite civilization. It was otherwise unknown to history, archaeological, uh, you know, all this stuff. And it's, the Hittite civilization had sort of a myth around it because it was only known from the Bible. And then yet, starting in 1872, uh, archaeologists uh, started you know, raising up a whole host, a trove of artifacts proving that the Hittite civilization existed, and not only existed, it was one of the most dominant force in its area. And so, scripture in some cases is well ahead of where scientific knowledge of the time is. 
Also, Scripture has authors that seem trustworthy, right? Um, they claim to be eyewitnesses, right? They didn't claim, you know, that this is something that was just revealed to them miraculously or something crazy. They, they claimed to see it with their own eyes. It wasn't just passed along from someone else. Um, scripture records that Jesus appeared to over 500 people uh, at one point after he was resurrected. Um, they claimed to be inspired by God, right? They wrote embarrassing things about himself, right? John writes that when Jesus was arrested, uh, he didn't stay and fight. and In fact, he fled, and someone grabbed his cloak, and so he shed it, and he just ran away naked, right? Um, there are so many times throughout scriptures that, that the apostles write things about themselves that are super embarrassing, about how they were arguing about things that they never should have been arguing about, uh, about how they were, they were just being dummies. I mean, this stuff is all throughout Scripture. They didn't hesitate to write it because they're not in it to make money. They're not in it to make a name for themselves like people writing some of those spurious books, right? Uh, They clearly did not collaborate their stories. If you look at the gospel accounts, while Matthew and Mark have a lot of overlap, there's a big difference in how Matthew and, and Mark and Luke and John approach their gospel accounts of Jesus' life, right? They're comfortable enough uh, in the reality of it to approach those from a different perspective, right? Uh, Matthew, you know, and Mark write for a, a certain chronology uh, from sort of a, a Jew and Roman to a Jew and Roman audience, respectively. Um, you've got Luke who sets out to write a a detailed history. And then you've got John who's like, I'm going to introduce you to this guy. He's an amazing guy. His name is Jesus. And sometimes John even goes out of order. He's so excited to tell you about who Jesus is. He, he goes out of chronological order just to tell you about stuff that Jesus did and how amazing that he was, right? Uh, and, and aside from all of this, the spread of the gospel worldwide is a testament to the belief that something powerful had happened here, that these writers believed it for themselves uh, and that someone powerful was behind what was going on. And today, you know, we have, it's the most dominant religion in the world. We got uh, so many, about two, two-thirds of people in the world are Christians because of the power and force behind this message. In Second Peter, Peter says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In 2 Timothy, Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And they wanted to pass along what they witnessed. So in the early church, in those first couple hundred years of the church's existence, they were not Bibles like we have today. They were not, you know, five in, in a quarter of all households Bibles, right? They were very rare the letters of scripture uh, on scrolls that were passed around from one church to one church to one church. Um, And the churches would gather. Whenever a scroll came through, your bishop or pastor might spread the word, hey, we've got a scroll of scripture. We got a scroll of 2 Timothy, right? Everyone gather at the house church tonight. They didn't have dedicated church, but they would gather at somebody's home and then they would take that scroll, they would read it, they would commit as much of it to memory as possible because the next morning they might have to pass it along to another church. And they would commit as much of it up here as they possibly could, pass it forward today. They would cherish it. They would place it deep within their hearts and their souls. Uh, and it was rare. And fast forward today, right, we've got five billion copies in the world that have ever been printed, right? Um, the next uh, largest religious work that's ever been printed 800 million copies, so significantly dwarfing that, right? Uh, For an English translation, we always look at ESV is what we quote up here, often recommend God's Word translation as well. But as of 2013, uh, about, you know, 3,000 of the languages in the world had at least a partial Bible translated. Uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators is currently going through its last languages campaign uh, to hope and their hope is to begin translating in the remaining languages by 2025. Isn't it hard to believe? Did you know that there are languages that still don't have a Bible? Right? A lot of small languages and small cultures still do not have the ability to, to read God's word in their native language. But, but it's touched nearly every corner of the globe and nearly all people throughout history. Check out some of these amazing quotes. These are really cool, right? Uh, so this is Sir Isaac Newton. He says, I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the word of God written by men who were inspired, and I study the Bible daily. He says, there are more sure marks of authenticity in the Bible than in any profane history, in any secular history. George Washington says it's impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. 
Abraham Lincoln, he's, this one's a thinker, all right? Uh, you're going to think about it later. But he says, take all that you can of the Bible upon reason and the balance on faith. George Washington Carver, the agricultural scientist, he said, the secret of my success, it's simple. It's found in the Bible, right? Sir Winston Churchill, the more closely we follow the Sermon on the Mount, the more likely we are to succeed in our endeavors. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt says, a, a thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. Some of you guys just graduated. Didn't you wish you know that? Like, you, you wouldn't have had to spend all that money. Uh, sorry, I should have done this sermon last week, right? But, uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth, right, says, uh, to what greater inspiration and counsel can we turn than to the imperishable truth to be found in this treasure house, the Bible? But, but don't just take the word of famous people for it, uh, famous people like myself, uh, or all of the evidence, right, from the manuscript authority to the content, but don't overlook the most compelling piece of Scripture, and that's Jesus, he himself is the embodiment of God in the flesh. He, in, in the things that he says and does, they're so incredibly profound and moving uh, that whether you're, you're a believer now or you're curious about Jesus or wherever you're at, you can't help but be stunned by some of the things that he says and does. And scripture prophesied much of it beforehand. I think there's about 300 prophecies in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, that Jesus fulfills, right? Uh, that he's a descendant of Abraham. He could not control that, right? Uh, born of a virgin, uh, born in Bethlehem. Again, things beyond his control, which he fulfills. He's rejected by his own people. He's presented as a king by riding in on a donkey. He's betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. Yeah, the 30 pieces thing, that specific number is prophesied ahead of time. He's crucified with thieves, that he's stripped and his clothing is gambled for, that he's buried in a rich man's tomb, resurrected and exalted and ascended into heaven. All these things and more prophesied about in the Old Testament hundreds of years, thousands of years at, with some of them before they actually came to be. The guy who can, whose birth is predicted who can predict his own death and resurrection, I'm going to go with that guy. I don't know what you guys think. He sounds pretty good to me, right? But think about how compelling Jesus is. I mean, for Christians, there, there's no other name by which we are saved. He's the one that grows to the cross, that Roman torture execution device, in order to reconcile us back to God in the divine story of God creating all things and stopping at nothing to bring his people back into a right relationship with him. It is by Jesus' name that we are saved, right? The gospel is the good news in Scripture, right, that Jesus has come to bear our burden of sin so that we might be redeemed and spend eternity with him. And think of all the pe things that people have done for him. How they have boldly gone to their deaths so that one more person can hear and proclaim his name. They've gone around the world, leaving their homes at, for years at a time, or sometimes even permanently, to reach people they don't even know in order to love them for a reason that goes deeper than we could possibly understand, right? Uh, Christians fo have funded most of the hospitals uh, and the hospital beds that exist around the world. They have been willing to give of themselves. Did you know a Barna study found that uh, the average, about 7 out of 10 Americans are actually charitable in their giving on a yearly basis. Um, you know, the average is about $100, um, but when you break it down further, non-Bible using Americans gave about $10, Bible using Americans gave about $500, Right? That it causes, something about scripture causes people to be generous with their money, with their time. Statistics show that Christians report uh, that scripture encourages them to love people of all races, uh, all ages, all genders, all nationalities. It causes uh, them to be all about refugees and the poor and the broken and to care for people who they don't even know because we have a God who loves us unconditionally and he calls us to do the same for others. And the more we encounter him in scripture, the more it changes us. Check out these great words from uh, Bishop N.T. Wright. I had an email just uh, early this morning from somebody wanting to um, take his study of Paul's theology to, to the next stage, as it were, somebody's a sort of master's degree level, asking me where it was all going, what it should be about. And I'm afraid I gave him the, the same old-fashioned advice that I give to everybody. You just have to soak yourself in the scripture much more than you'd ever imagine doing, preferably in the original languages. And you have to soak yourself in prayer and you have to listen hard 
to the cries of pain that are coming, whether from your next door neighbor or from people on the other side of the world. Uh, Jesus himself uh, and the New Testament itself teach us that the way we get to know who we are and where we're called to be is through scripture, through prayer, through the sacraments, Jesus himself constituting these as the way of life for God's people, baptism and the Lord's Supper particularly. Um, but then also the cry of the poor in Matthew 25, Jesus tells us that's where we will actually meet him without even realizing we're doing so. And it seems to me that in each generation, there is no formula, there is no, hey, this is the book you should read and then it'll all be all right. Because God wants to do new things, but the people through whom he will do those new things are people who are Bible people, prayer people, sacrament people, and listening to the poor people. And somehow Jesus will come afresh to them and please God through them in ways that we can't at the moment imagine or predict, let alone control. I love that. The more that we soak and immerse ourselves in Scripture, uh, the more we're able to do something amazing because God wants us to do something new in you, in me, and in us as a community. We, it says on our website, and we more than just have it on there, we believe it. We practice and uphold the ancient truths of the faith expressed in a modern way as we seek to make a difference in our community. That our heart uh, is to be a church of the ancient faith, to have deep roots in that which is true, and to dig in as much as we possibly can. Because we, the more we dig into Scripture, the more it causes us to be about our community. And the more we live out Scripture in our community, it causes us to go back to God's Word. The Barna Organization has this great chart of Bible engagement in our country. And it kind of talks about Bible disengaged folks all the way to Bible-centered folks. Uh, and I'm curious, if you were to place yourself on this spectrum, where would you put yourself? Bible disengaged, right? You, you interact with the Bible infrequently, no impact really. Uh, neutral folks, you might interact with it sporadically. It has little spiritual influence in your life, though. Bible-friendly people interact with it consistently, and it may be a source of spiritual insight. Bible engaged, it's frequently, uh, and it is transforming their relationships. Bible-centered people, it's also tr shaping our choices, right? Uh, that our heart is to be a people who are engaged with God's life-giving word. Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. And that message that he gives us of what it means to live life to the full, that comes from us in scripture. And the question for us this week is, how can we go from being Bible disengaged or from wherever we happen to find ourselves and take a step toward being Bible-centered? First John 3.18 says we must show love through actions that are sincere, not through empty words, right? Uh, and if we never pick it up or sporadically pick it up, we tell others to believe it, we tell others your morals should abide by Scripture and you should read it and we're not doing the same, then it's just empty, empty words. We must show through love and through actions and through our own engagement with and living out of Scripture that the Bible is true for people. How will they know that it's true? Because they see it at work in you and in me. We have great resources here to help you on your Bible journey. You can get a free Bible in the, the uh, Welcome Center in the, the coffee lounge or in the, the lobby if you want to grab one. We also have these life journals. Uh, we have free life journal reading plans, uh, again, next to the Bibles. We have these, uh, for six bucks, you can get one of these spiral journals at the Renewal Store. Uh, this is a phenomenal reading plan that many of us go through together uh, so that when we gather for our life groups and so on, we can go, hey, in your reading today, did you read that thing? What did you think of that? Or was that weird, or, or was it just me, or whatever else, right? Uh, the Life Journal reading plan is a great opportunity to get into God's Word, and you do not have to do the journaling component if that's not something that's valuable to you. But I encourage you to grab a reading plan if you're not going through something currently. We also have our Scripture on the Go podcast, uh, which we, we post um, you know, weekly or every other week, these podcasts around the reading plan. And this season has been so much fun, guys. We've been digging into passages that... We intentionally are identifying which passages in t today's readings are likely to be the most difficult and most confusing. And we've been digging into those on the podcast, which has been a ton of fun. And so I encourage you to get the podcast on your Renewal Church Denver app uh, or check it out online at scriptureonthego.org, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and you can also read the Bible in the app as well. What's really cool is in that Renewal Church Denver app, you go to the Bible tab, the uh, the Life Journal Bible reading plan is actually queued up for you in the app, and you can follow along. You can make it read to you. So um, we want to be getting into Scripture. Another great way to get into Scripture is through the Abide app. We have a, a, a new member who is on the team for the Abide app, and that's another great way that you can help have meditations 
read or spoken to you that will help you meditate around God's word and really soak it in, uh, you know, get, get totally soaked with it uh, in order that it might shape us in mind and body and spirit. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. This is Jesus' encouragement to us. Why should we trust the Bible? Because the Bible is trustworthy. And in its pages, our life, so that we may live it to the full, stake everything on its word, sell out completely for it, and let it change you. Let it, through immersion in it, let it soak not just our minds, but also our deeds and everything that we do in Scripture that we may be the people of God, people of hope, people who have staked it not on nebulous claims, but on the rock, on Jesus himself. Join me in prayer.